can uh, if you can imagine being being so wealthy that you build a theater looking out over the Mediterranean Sea is pretty awesome. Uh, you know, it's a, it's a pretty amazing place. They've they've restored it. Um, so what what you're what you're walking on is not obviously original. If anything, if anything has fairly sharp corners like this, you know it's not original. That would be very worn down. When we we will see, we'll see many many things that were from the first century or even well before the, today. When we get to Megiddo, we'll see some gates that were uh, late Bronze Age. Um, but when you have something like this, we'll, we'll be in a theater later today where you will see the difference between a theater that was reconstructed and what it originally looked like because the same theater has both both parts. But they redid this because they still do shows here. They still have concerts here. Many times I've come and they've had some kind of backstage for sound purposes. If you, if you put it back on that, the acoustics here are pretty unbelievable. Um, it's really, it's really something. Okay, so <laughs> I wanted to get it, get you up here so you can think about uh, Herod the Great a little bit. Um, when that verse starts in Matthew 2, verse 1, um, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem, in Judea, during the time of King Herod, I think Matthew, in writing that, puts a cultural context in place. Later in this trip, we're going to talk about what a crucifixion was like. Um, and a crucifixion was very gruesome. But to our 21st century American minds and ears and eyes and experiences, it's crucial to explain what a crucifixion was like because um, we, we know nothing about it. But when you read the Gospels, it describes so much of Jesus' trials and uh, all of these things, and then it'll just be, and they crucified him. Because the gospel writers didn't have to explain crucifixion. The people um, that wrote those gospels, uh, those documents, everyone they knew knew exactly what crucifixion was. And it's the same here. When Matthew says that Jesus, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem, in Judea, during the times of Herod the Great, um, he assumes we all know what that means and the feelings we ought to have. But removed by 2,000 years, we don't feel what we ought to feel when we hear that after Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea in the time of Herod the Great. We don't feel what I think we should feel. So my goal um, for about 15 or 20 minutes right now is to help you begin to feel what you should feel when you read that phrase and when you hear about Herod the Great. And then I'm going to walk you to a couple places and we will keep talking about Herod the Great um, for the next many, many days. Okay, Herod the Great, very complicated man. Uh, racially, he was, he was an Arab. His father was from an Arab tribe, uh, what was Southern Israel, it, the Idumeans. Um, and we'll talk about more about that when we get to the Herodian. But his mother was from the region of Petra, which is that red rock city over in Jordan. Uh, so racially, he's an Arab, but religiously, he's Jewish. So in about 135 BC, the Idumeans were overtaken by the Jews. They became Jews religiously. And um, so religiously, he's a, a Jew, although he never was a very good one. But we'll talk about that. Culturally, he was fully Greek. Hellenistic culture, Greek culture had taken spread throughout Palestine by that time, especially those that were, that were not fully committed to God, not fully following the Old Testament law, is very much of a Greek culture. Uh, Greek was likely Herod's first language. So we know um, racially he's Arab, spiritually he's Jewish, culturally he's Greek, and politically he was Roman, 100% Roman. Uh, in every major conflict during his reign, he always sided with Rome every single time. And being racially Arab, religiously Jewish, culturally Greek, um, and politically Roman, <laughs> he was a very complex man. His, you can read a, a descriptions of him that he, he was, uh, when he was young, he was considered powerful and very good looking. He led 10 different armies into wars. So in the first century, uh, who rules the world in the first century in this area? Who rules it? Rome, right. Uh, and who's in charge of Rome? They call him Caesar, yes. So when Caesars rule the world, how do they rule the world? I mean, that's, 
their kingdom is vast. To travel from one end of the kingdom to the other would take months. So how do you do it? Here's, here's what they would do. They would have a vassal state and they would find someone in that place like Israel and find someone that will rule for them. But it must be for them. So the idea is if you rule well and you always side with Rome and you pay the appropriate amount of taxes to Rome, then you can live a very lavish lifestyle and you will be the most powerful person in this country. But you must always be loyal to Rome, always. Um, and then the nice part is, then you don't even have to create your own army. Rome will supply soldiers for you. So they'll defend you. Uh, so you have all the perks of kingship, none of the uh, deficits of it in trying to conquer or to rule, really rule. You're just trying to rule your own people uh, and make sure your people stay subservient to Rome. So there's this constant friction between I'm trying to stay faithful to Rome, but I don't want to be hated by my own people, you know. So trying to live that tension is tough. Take it from a pastor through the time of COVID. Trying to please everybody doesn't happen. Um, did I say that out loud? I should not say that. <laughs> um, so they picked Herod to rule here in, uh, in Israel. And um, they proclaimed him king. He called himself the king of the Jews, but the people never did. He, he liked to call himself that. Um, and here's where it gets interesting. Herod was incredibly smart politically. Um, Antony, you, you may know this from, from history, uh, Antony wars, ends up warring against Octavian about who will rule Rome. Antony versus Octavian, there's quite a battle. Herod sides with Antony. He wants him to be the next Caesar. Uh, Antony and Cleopatra. The problem is Octavian won decisively. He becomes Caesar Augustus. And he wins that battle. So the problem is Herod has clearly sided with Antony, even in defeat. So you would think that Herod's going down now because he sided with the, with the wrong guy. He sided with Antony and Caesar Augustus wins. Uh, Octavian wins, becomes Caesar Augustus. So he ends up being granted an audience before Caesar Augustus. And there's this famous quote. Uh, um, my wife said that, so a week, two weeks ago, I didn't come here because I was sitting in quarantine for a day um, waiting. I, I think you all probably know that story, right? Mm -hmm. I got quarantined for one day. They took another test. I took a rapid test in the hotel. That was negative. So they gave me another um, PCR test. That came out negative so I could rejoin the group. The Anastels also took a rapid test today and it was positive. So they're, they're probably looking at, at the five days. But So I missed this part. So Sue told me that, that she thinks the movie uh, mentions this particular story. But he, he, re, he gets this audience before Caesar. Um, and of course, it should be his death sentence. But at the climax of his speech, he says this. Here's a quote. What I ask of you is to consider not whose friend, but what a good friend I was. So... And Caesar Augustus says, okay, you'll be loyal, you, you keep your job. So it was a pretty smooth move. Um, you know, you take the wrong side and still end up on top, I don't get it. But mm -hmm. I, it was actually a pretty brilliant move that um, don't think about who I sided with. Think about once I sided with them, I stayed with them no matter what. And basically now I will side with you. And it worked. Um, so it secured his position. He was, um, the, the best word I can give you um, <coughs> for Herod the Great is overkill. Uh, just in everything, it was overkill. Um, I mean, well, look at this. We're sitting in a theater uh, from ancient days that's looking over the Mediterranean Sea. Um, overkill with his family. He had um, 10 or 11 wives, depending on what you read, 43 children. Overkill in his cruelty. He killed a lot of people. To, to come the ruler of the area, he killed a lot of people. Massacred a lot of people in Jerusalem. <clears throat> killed Jews throughout his reign who did not do what he wanted them to do. He showed overkill in his loyalty to Caesar. Again, he has to do that, he thinks, or he'll lose his, his position, which is true. So he builds, builds statues to Caesar. He builds altars to Caesar. Inscriptions all over to Caesar, including inscriptions that end up saying, Caesar is God now you have a problem. There's two problems there. One, declaring Caesar to be God, obviously is a huge problem in your, you're in Israel. What's, what's the problem with building statues and all of that? Why is that a problem? Yeah, it's an idol. You, in fact, when we, um, 
When we travel around, you'll see different mosaics on floors. We'll, we'll likely <laughs> see some later at the end of today, depending on how much time we have in, in Zephyrus. But um, when, when, um, when ancient Jews would make mosaics, they wouldn't even put animals or people in their mosaics. They're only designs because they were afraid of breaking that commandment to have any idol of anything. Um, so he's not loved by the Jewish people. He shows overkill in his extravagance. This city is was extravagant. In fact, um, Josephus wrote about this city in the Jewish wars. Josephus, uh, uh, Flavius Josephus, was he tended to exaggerate, and he's known for exaggeration. So, before archaeologists discovered this city decades ago, the assumption was his his incredible description of this city was just is Josephus. He's exaggerating. Then archaeologists discovered the city. And it was extravagant. It's an unbelievable city. Uh, Herod had many palaces. We're going to visit several of them on this trip. Um, and he wanted to build one here on the Mediterranean Sea and called it Caesarea for Caesar. It took him 12 years to build this city, finished it just a handful of years before Jesus was born, finished it in 10 BC. Jesus was born somewhere between, I don't know, 4 and 6 BC, somewhere in there. Um, Herod wanted a state of, our, of an art city. So this was marshy out here, and he rebuilt the coastline so that he could put the city right on the coastline. He, he drained the marshes. Um, again, naming it Caesarea for Caesar. He's trying to, he's saying, I'm building it for you. So yes, it's extravagant, but it's for you, Caesar. And how many times did Caesar ever visit here? Yeah, zero. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so who's it for? <laughs> Herod. There's a palace. He literally put a palace on the water. Uh, you're going to see that the remains of his palace. He doesn't want a palace next to the water. He wants it on the water. <laughs> this is uh, this is our friend King Herod. Um, the largest uh, harbor at the time was Athens, and it was a 60-acre harbor. So Herod the Great decided he wanted to do it larger. So he built a harbor that's 520 acres here. <laughs> um, and this became the largest harbor in the world at the time. In fact, there's a, there was a floor he put in the, in the bottom of the sea at the harbor. There's, there's dives that people still do to go down and look at the work of Herod the Great. It's an engineering marvel. He created an underwater sewage system that the sewage would drain with the tides. Um, here's his biggest problem. And this is always the biggest problem in the ancient world, fresh water. Um, we worry about, can I drink the water from the tap in Israel or not? You know, they worried about, is there fresh water nearby? And the answer is no. So how do you build this massive city? And by the way, uh, this would seat uh, 4,000 or more. And the typical Roman standard, it's been said, was you tried to build a theater that would seat at least 10% of the city. He may have built this one larger. So this was a, this was a good sized city, Caesarea, at the time. Um, his source of water was perhaps about eight miles away. So how do you get fresh water from eight miles away from a spring? You build an aqueduct and you are going to get a chance to walk under Herod the Great's aqueduct. After we get on the bus, we're going to go about a mile or two north and walk under his aqueduct. And uh, you get a chance to go down to the sea if you'd like to. Um, so he built this aqueduct that is, it has a cover on it. Uh, the cover is not visible in most places. When we go to see the aqueduct, I'll point out there's a smaller aqueduct that still has the cover on it nearby. Um, so he's going to bring fresh water into the city that way, and he got it done. All by gravity. It just dropped at just the right percentage and level that fresh water was flowing into the city. Everything was overkill. Uh, his pool that he had out here, that, by the way, the Mediterranean Sea has a higher salt content than the ocean, uh, but, but not nearly as high as the Dead Sea. Um, so he wanted a freshwater pool. So he builds a palace on the Mediterranean Sea with a freshwater pool in the salty Mediterranean Sea. <laughs> this guy is overkill. Uh, and of course, it's all for Caesar, mind you. Uh, that's why he did it. Um, this city was eventually trashed during the Jewish Revolt. So we'll talk about the Jewish Revolt quite a bit. The Jewish Revolt um, happened in the late 60s. And about 80, 70, Titus, not the guy the book of the Bible is written to, but Titus, the Roman military general, comes. And this was the opulent city of, of Israel, so he crushed this city to the ground. Um, and threw, threw as much as he could of it into the Mediterranean Sea. Um, 
but overkill. Everything's overkill. All these wives, all these children. He became suspicious of one of his wives, so he had her executed. He, uh, he viewed his sons as a threat to his kingdom. He drowned one of his sons in a family pool because he was suspicious that he wanted to be king. He had two of his favorite sons strangled because they, in, he incorrectly believed they were plotting to take over his kingdom. He was a really paranoid dude. Um, he was brilliant. He was brutal. He was paranoid. There was a dispute with the Sanhedrin, which was like the religious supreme court of the nation. He had a dispute with them, so he executed them because he could. Uh, we, were, we were told that, that he was bothered that the Jews didn't love him, and they thought he they should love him because he was a Jew religiously. So he died down in Jericho. We're going to pass by Jericho in a few days. We unlikely to go into Jericho, but he died at his palace in Jericho, and. Uh, before he died, he was concerned that the country would rejoice. So he commanded for all the influential Jews in Jericho and beyond to be arrested and put into uh, the stadium in Jericho. And when he died, they were to execute all of them. Because he, he said, that will, uh, that will um, be sure, I will be sure there will be mourning in the nation of Israel on the day of my death. That's how wicked this dude was. Now, thankfully, uh, they didn't follow through on killing all of those people. Um, but this is Caesarea. This is one city. And, and I'm going to keep saying, Herod the Great built this. Herod the Great built this. You're going to have a chance to walk on his palaces, uh, walk in his palaces. You're, you're going to have a chance to do things in places that Herod the Great built and owned that you would be executed for 2,000 years ago uh, that are remains today. So how did you do all this? How do you build all these opulent there's up to 15 palaces he had through the country. How do you, how do you build all that? Taxes. Mm. Yeah, slave labor too, but taxes is how you're gonna pay for that labor. Um, and so he taxed the people to death. You know, as uh, you, you can see different numbers, but you know, maybe it's 50% of your fish went to Herod, 25 to 33% of your grain, and you'd fish all night, you'd get to port, and there's a tax collector wanting to collect. 50% for Herod, 25% for me, the tax collector, and you keep maybe this 25%. There's estimations of the taxation was somewhere between 75%, some say up to 90%. So you, you can imagine, we joked yesterday about there's 100% taxation on cars here. Well, just on income, it would have been very, very high, very debilitating. And why are you getting taxed so heavily by Herod? So that he can build a theater looking out on the Mediterranean Sea that you'll never enjoy and you couldn't afford to go to. Um, and then you had, you know, if you're a Jew, you have these 12.5% goes to Caesar, 50% goes to Herod, and then there's Roman tribute tax and trade tax and temple tax and fair market tax and, and taxing your bread and your fish and your income and your property. There's these special, of course, then there's the offerings that God calls for that are from your own property that you have to give toward. Um, it was terrible. People are losing their lands. People, the... Uh, they would have to sell their land to be able to make it, even though they, they'll get their land back at the year of Jubilee, but it was just, they're working day to day. Payment was not, you might get paid every week or every two weeks. They're paid on a daily basis so they could afford living. And why are you taxed? Why is your life so difficult so Herod could live a life of opulence? You can understand why he wasn't loved. There's a story that one time he put an eagle uh, going into the temple that represented Caesar. And uh, just an insult to Jewish people that are going to worship God. And he, he puts this eagle on top of the uh, arch going in. So some Jews went up and cut it down. And he found them, hunted them down, found them, and had them executed. Uh, so they didn't love him religiously. And they certainly, did, certainly didn't love him politically or economically. And so when Matthew says, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem, in Judea, during the time of Herod the Great, that should make you feel something. This is not some neutral king. This is, a, this is someone who is an egomaniac that is out for his power, his pleasure, his glory, his honor, and possessions, and building his name for himself. And Matthew wants us to know that setting. And to this culture, Jesus shows up. We're going to talk about this today. I'm going to talk about it when we're in Jerusalem toward the end of the trip. But into that scene, a new king shows up. And a new king shows up on the scene. And as we travel around, I want you to remember this. That, that the reason Jesus wasn't well accepted um, was because they wanted someone to overthrow Herod the Great. And when Jesus made it clear he's not here for a political purpose, people lost interest in Jesus. 
but now when Jesus is born, a new king is on the scene, you've been reduced to poverty, you're paying taxes, you're living on less and less and less it feels like, oppressors are oppressing more and more and more, you've lost your land, you're living hand to mouth, you're counting on getting hired the next day, and into this scene, whispers come through from Bethlehem to Jerusalem that a new king is on the scene. People are heavy in debt, paying incredible taxes, and Herod's building another palace. Herod lives in luxury off of your hard-earned money, off the backs of you and your family and your friends and your neighbors. And all of a sudden, whisper comes into the village, have you heard a new king has been born, Herod's going down. Tomorrow or the next day, we'll start talking about, people will, 30 years later, saying, have you seen this guy in Capernaum? Have you seen what he's done? His reputation begins to spread. You've got to see this. There's hope that begins to spring. Imagine that hope. But as you know, the kingship of Jesus was not the kingship they expected. They wanted a kingship of property. He wants a kingship of the heart. His kingship of this land is coming later. He wants the kingship of his heart to start now. And people want a king of their land who will do what's best for them. They don't want a king of their heart that directs their life where he wants it to go. But be sure of this. And this is what I love about starting in Caesarea as we begin moving around the nation of Israel. By the way, we're gonna, we've, we've started kind of in the southwest. We're now going to be on the west side. We're going to go north. We're going to be on the northeast. We're going to come down the east side, be on the southeast side, and we'll end in Jerusalem because that's my favorite city in the world. Um, but this, I think, might be my favorite day because we're here at the start to look at Herod the Great and say, who is he? And what I want you to think about as we walk through this, as you walk through the courtyard of his palace, as you look in his palace, and as later you begin to walk through other things he's built, including some of his palaces, that the kingdom of Herod is ancient history. He built a kingdom for himself, but now it's archeological history. And Jesus never built a palace, but his kingdom still reigns. His kingdom still continues. His kingdom goes on. And our world continues to look for a local, temporary ruler who will give them what they want. And God is still going after the heart. And eventually, every kingdom of the world, every herod of the world, eventually burns out and his kingdom dies. And the kingdom of Jesus just keeps going. And everywhere we go, the next week and a half, you're going to see remnants of Herod's power, of Rome's power. And just remind yourself of two things. They were looking for temporary relief, and Jesus had bigger things in mind. And secondly, the kingdom of Jesus is stronger than air ever, and Herod's kingdom, the Roman kingdom, is left to history and is left to archaeology. Um, and that's Herod the Great. So as we go around, we'll point out some things. We're going to walk down together to his palace. I'm going to talk to you about some of the things that happened there at that palace or very near that palace. But if you want to grab some pictures, and I'll just take a slow walk over toward the palace you can follow.